Hey, so in this video we'll take a look at all the additional physical modifications I've made to the MMU um, and also the current test, uh, testing and developing setup that I'm using um, to program. So um, I've actually done quite a lot of uh, small modifications uh, because I just assembled the entire thing and started programming and editing um, Marlin and it's at that point that you realize that there are problems like two parts don't fit together very well, there is a part that doesn't turn because the clearances are different. Um, so you just need to adapt your model a little bit and this is mainly what I've done. Um, so we'll first take a look at the current uh, setup that I'm working with um, and uh, pro programming on. So since this entire project is based uh, on a 3D printer main board and it works in unison with the Marlin firmware, I should basically use an entire 3D printer uh, to do everything and test that it works and uh, that kind of things. But I actually cannot afford to do that because I only uh, have uh, two printers, um, but I actually need them to be fully functional in order to have enough manufacturing capacities to print all my prototypes and to test them without having them piling up, piling up in the list of things I have to print. So I kind of need to simulate having a printer uh, in order to test my code. So in order to do that, I will just use the main board and a few motors uh, and that should do the trick just fine. And because we are adding some of those and upgrading um, some of those, at least for the main board, I actually have those pieces on hand without having to change anything on the actual printer. So I first ran into a few issues um, in the case of powering the main board. So as the people who have watched my other videos and are subscribed um, may know, we are running the SKR Pro V1.1. So this board does accept USB power, uh, but this won't be enough to power all the motors. Um, and the board actually doesn't allow to power the motors uh, through USB. So the obvious answer to that problem would be to use a regular 3D printer power supply. But since the two I have are currently being used by my 3D printers, and since I don't want to spend any extra money on a power supply that I actually don't need, I decided to try to go another way. So I first tried to use uh, those small uh, power supply bricks uh, that you can use uh, with uh, a, a small jack um, uh, adapter. But the thing is, it was way too low in terms of wattage. Um, so I had barely enough uh, current to power a few motors. So I won't even speak about plugging in basically everything and doing a test print. Uh, so I then remember that I had um, an old desktop power supply that I had salvaged from a dead pre-built desktop and uh, I think it was a Dell or an HP and uh, in order to power on a PC power supply without having the computer attached because usually you just click on the computer power button and this turns on the power supply because a power supply is not on by default. Um, you need to short two wires. Uh, so this is pretty easy in theory since these cables are always the same on 24 pins power supply. But as I mentioned before, I am using a power supply that was salvaged inside a pre-built and they use a proprietary power supply uh, from ACBL, so the HBD002 and it's using a proprietary pin configuration. So it has an eight pin and a four pin for the CPU. And this is a really specific configuration that is like absolutely uncommon and not used. And uh, this is actually the reason why I replaced it in the first place because it was not compatible with the new hardware I needed to uh, fix the desktop computer. So I had no clue of which wires I had to uh, short. Uh, but since all the wires on the eight pin seem to be a pair of plus and ground wires, so because of the color coding, there were four yellow wires and four black wires. So I kind of expected that they were uh, plus and minus wires. Um, uh, I deducted that the cables related to turning on the power supply uh, were on the four pin. And at that point, I just 
kind of saw the the cables there was uh, let me check the colors uh so yeah there was um a violet a brown a green and a black wire and uh, i just respected the usual color coding on regular power supplies um i shorted the black and the green wires and it worked so i then measured the different leads to check that i had all the right voltages and um I was right, uh, at least for the 8-pin cables, because all the 8-pin connectors were a pair of 12-volt wires. So this was exactly what I needed, because this is a board that runs on 12-volt, and uh, yeah. So I first connected uh, one pair to the motor power uh, to on the main board, and I used another pair um, on the... Uh, the board power so to power the, the the board and the entire system so i then had to configure the stepper drivers so since i'm not using them in spi or yard configuration um and that's because we're using the a498 stepper drivers i remove all the jumpers on the first row uh, row which are exactly for that uh, I then use one of them to connect the reset pin of the A49A to the slip pin, um, so on the same board. Uh, and this is because the reset pin on the A49A is by default floating. Uh, and you may know this if you have actually tried to program one um, in any kind of Arduino project. And since we don't want to control it, we can just connect it to the sleep so that the board stays in a functional status uh, all the time. So we then connect uh, the M0, M1, and M2 pin pins on the board to the 3.3 volt, uh, since we want uh, one thing seen micro-stepping, uh, and this is the setup required to achieve this base on the A498A documentation. So high, high, high um, to get the correct micro-stepping. So once I had done all that, uh, I just had to check that the actual board um, power setup was set to 12 slash 24 volts uh, and not USB because otherwise it won't work. And I then turned on my power supply uh, by shorting the two wires I mentioned before. Um, and I then used the uh, Marlin firmware uh, to move the X axis and check that the motors were running smoothly. Uh, and it was the case, so I really Apparently everything is working as it should. Uh, now let's take a look at this screen. So I choose this one because it can work in two modes. So Marlin and touch. The Marlin mode is less easy on the eyes, uh, but it gets the job done. And the touch mode, um, which kind of runs the screens and then sends commands to the board is nicer to use. And it also gives me the ability to send G code directly to the board. So this way I can test um, tool change by sending the specific G-code command, uh, which is T01, etc. Um, and see if it works without having to use an SD card with the custom code, starting a print, etc. And I believe that this will help us uh, bypass all the templated security on Marlin. Uh, because we don't need to start a print in order to test if our code works. So we don't need to set a specific extruder temperature and I guess uh, that this wouldn't activate um, all the thermistor securities, but I will have to check on that. I just know that this may be a way easier option to test uh, the tool change, uh, but we will see if it works at a later date. So now regarding the modifications I made to the different 3D files, uh, most of them were related to clearance issues, as I said before. So I first cut the bearing holding uh, compartment on the idler body uh, because it was interfering with the motor and shaft coupler, uh, so on the pulley body. Uh, I also decided to go without any bearings on the opening and closing mechanism um, because I realized that the 608 bearings that I plan on using, which are widely available and relatively cheap, uh, were not really adapted for this application. And that the amount of friction that was on the part uh, without using any bearings was minimal. And since this mechanism 
was to be used on like very rare occasions. So compared to other mechanical parts like the extruder, uh, I think that it won't cause many problems and it will simplify the entire build. So I also chose to use a metal rod that was going through the entire way uh, to make things easier. Um, and one bonus point is that when buying the rod uh, for the extruder, you will most likely have a bit left uh, to do exactly that because we are using the exact same uh, rod diameter. Um, and this, the fact that you are using a single piece rod to make this opening mechanism compared to two small pins um, makes the overall build uh, a lot sturdier and also it may it requires uh, less cut uh, on the metal rod so uh, it makes the assembly a bit easier. So I next had, uh, I next, uh, had issues with the extruder gear uh, which were too high uh, and that's because I'm not using the uh, same one uh, they use on the MMU2. Uh, which have uh, kind of a slot in them for the filament to go in. Um, and so the result of that uh, was that the gear was higher and was interfering with the filament. Um, so to think that it was quite easy, I just had to reprint the part with the gear placement 1.75 millimeter lower. And uh, when I mean gear placement, um, it's basically motor placement um, and the uh, gears hole placement as well as the shaft hole placement 1.75 millimeter lower. So now let's take a look at the other main body part, uh, which is the idler body. So I first had to make the holes for the springs bigger. Uh, this was quite an easy fix. Um, and th this is simply because I'm not using the same springs. I'm using a uh, regular 3D printer hotbed uh, springs. And um, yeah, uh, I then had to add an end stop uh, to the idler body um, because uh, I don't have um, so because the A49A drivers don't have a sensorless homing feature contrary to the MMU2 drivers which are the TMC2130 I believe and these have a sensorless homing feature um, and why have I decided to go this way it's simply because the A49A were what I had on hand and because they were cheaper. Um, so the switch was placed in the same spot as the original end stop and the design I chose worked actually really well. So I had an enclosure for the switch um, so all, all around it um, with a single screw hole on the outside to secure it in. Um, and in order to stop it from swiveling, I created a small ledge in front of the switch um, and since the switch enclosure is opened on the top and on the bottom, uh, the switch can be pressed on the top by the idler when it rotates uh, to a certain point. Uh, and we also still have an access uh, to all the cables, which is quite important if we want to read any data that's coming out of this. So um, this then created another issue uh, because the switch was about 6.02 millimeters in width. And the groove on the idler uh, for that switch, so uh, for what was initially the end stop, was six millimeters. So I had to make it larger, and this is what I am pre printing currently. Okay, um, so this is it regarding the physical changes and my current testing setup. Uh, as I said, I have already done quite a bit of work uh, firmware wise, so we should have some results in a matter of days. Uh, and of course, uh, comment with that uh, video. So uh, thanks for watching. If you like this video and want to see more, make sure to subscribe and see you next time.